Welcome to DIM 400's lecture on basic radiological interpretation. I'm Dr. LaRue and I'll be giving these lectures. All of the lectures on the thorax, abdomen and musculoskeletal system, as well as equines, are based on principles from this lecture. So please make sure you understand this section well. Basic radiological interpretation refers to what happens after the images are obtained. The images need to be viewed in the correct orientation then the entire radiograph carefully assessed and changes or pathology described, and then a diagnosis can be made and further tests can be decided on. So it requires a logical and disciplined approach and it needs time without rushing. The radiologic, uh, radiologist environment needs to be optimized for reading. And ideally this consists of a darkened room that's undisturbed, for the older film type radiographs, it would be a light box with shielding, hot light or magnifying glass, and then anatomy text, bone specimens, and normal images can also help. For digital radiography, an adequate monitor is needed to assess images. Reporting is just another word for reading or interpretation of a radiograph. So firstly, we need the correct views, so two orthogonal views at 90 degrees to each other. While reading a radiograph, we assess the exposure quality and we decide is it diagnostic or is there a problem, for example, under or over exposure. And then we decide if it needs to be repeated. Collimation we, refers to the area of interest being included in the X-ray. And then artifacts need to be recognized and then decided whether they hamper evaluation of the X-ray or not. Radiological signalment is a very important concept um, to be aware of as it gives us an idea of what conditions we expect in a certain patient. So knowing the signalment helps us decide if a diagnosis is likely in a patient. For example, having um, a radiograph of an abdomen of a male dog would make um, the diagnosis of a pyometra, for example, impossible. So for species, we can determine from the radiograph if we're looking at a horse or a cat or a bird or a dog. Breed it's, is not usually um, something that we can determine in um, animals such as horses or cats, but in dogs at least we can determine whether it is chondrodystrophic, for example, a dachshund, or brachycephalic like an English bulldog by looking at the spine or the skull. For sex, if we are um, looking at an abdominal radiograph, the presence of the os penis or testicles lets us know that it is male. For age, we just determine two things, whether or not um, the patient is skeletally mature or immature. In these examples over here, these black lines or radiolucent lines are the open physis, so they're um, made of cartilage. So in these two patients, um, they are both skeletally immature versus a skeletally mature patient, these physis will have disappeared. For body condition, from a thoracic or abdominal radiograph, we can determine if the patient is emaciated, normal, or obese. So on these slides are just some examples. The top left is a feline patient's thorax. Um, note how slender and dainty the vertebra are, as well as the spinous processes, and even the sternebra are quite long and thin. Versus a canine patient on the bottom left, the vertebra are quite um, block-like and sturdy, and the same goes for the sternebra, as an example. On the right-hand side, we've got orthogonal views of a feline patient's thorax, um, just demonstrating body condition. In this case, there's a lot of falciform fat and um, subcutaneous fat in this patient that we can see outside of the thorax. In this lateral view of the abdomen, there are two things that tell us that it is a male canine. The one is the presence of the os penis, and another one is the presence of this round soft tissue structure in the caudal abdomen, which is the prostate. Note how this patient is skeletally mature because we don't see any radiolucent open physis in areas where we might expect them in a younger animal. Image orientation refers to how the image is held up or viewed on the light box or how we orientate it on the screen. With a lateral view, the patient's head is always to the left and the spine or the dorsum is always to the top. 
So it doesn't matter how it was acquired. For example, this is a left lateral and this is a right lateral. In both cases, we orientate it the same way. For a DV or a VD, the cranial part or the head of the patient is to the top and the right side is to the left of the images. And this is all radiological convention that you will see in all textbooks. If it's a series of radiographs, um, it's important to always try to put them in the same order. And this helps with pattern recognition. So if you're used to seeing an image in the same orientation time after time, it becomes easier for the brain to detect pathology with practice. Part of systematic uh, evaluation is to know the normal anatomy. Um, there will be some variations with age. So in a skeletally immature patient, the facies will be open and the secondary centers of ossification, such as the tibial tuberosity, may not be fused yet. Some species may have differences. For example, in cats, there's always the presence of the clavicle, which is not present in the dog except as a redundant structure in large breed dogs. It's also important to know the effective positioning, which will be discussed more in the thoracic and abdominal sections. But by positioning the patients dorsally or ventrally, um, gas will move dorsally and fluid will move ventrally or dependently. So certain organs may be highlighted versus others not. The Rintgen signs are also a very important concept. Um, they are descriptors used to describe the findings on the radiograph. So for each lesion that we see, we describe it using the following. The size in centimeters or millimeters, or you can use a reference to another structure. Um, the shape, the structure or the lesion could be round or square or fusiform. The number, is, is it a single lesion? Or are there two or multiple lesions? The location refers to the anatomical location. It's important to be as specific as possible. So if we're talking about a bone, refer to either the metaphysis or the diaphysis or the epiphysis. If we're talking about a lung lobe, um, say which specific lobe it is located in. Margination just refers to the edges of the lesion. Is, are they smooth? Are they irregular? And then the radio opacity refers to the color or the shade of gray scale. And this tells you what the structure is made of. So in radiology, there are five radio opacities, and we'll discuss this on the next slide. So in order of increasing um, uh, radio opacity, we start with gas, which is the most radiolucent. So it appears black on a radiograph because most x-rays can uh, reach the detector or the film. Moving up, there's fat, then soft tissues, um, which include fluid, water, muscle, um, or any organs or hemorrhage, for example, mineral, which is bone or mineralized soft tissue, and then the whitest or the most radiopaque um, is metal. And the reason why we've got different radio opacities um, is demonstrated uh, on this um, image. So if we have the five radio opacities, air, fat, water, bone, and metal, and their physical density and atomic number increases from left to right. If these um, tissues or structures of same thickness are compared to the same or are exposed to the same um, oncoming x-rays, with air, because of its low density and low atomic number, will allow most of the x-rays to transmit and reach the detector and result in a black image. Fat will transmit um, also most of the x-rays, but less so than air. Water, even less so. Bone will transmit even less of them. And metal, because it's the densest and has the highest atomic number of all of these, will transmit the least. Therefore, effectively blocking the x-ray from reaching the detector and then resulting in the image being white. Here's an example of a radiograph of a monkey, just showing the, um, the different opacities. So the metal marker is very bright white. Bone is a little bit less than that, but it's still quite radio opaque. So all the, the bony structures are similar. For soft tissues, we're looking here at, um, for example, the liver or the muscles. And then even more radiolucent is fat. 
So here will be a bit of a mental or a mesenteric fat. And then the most radiolucent would be gas. So, for example, in the lung or even around the patient. Now, the gas around the patient looks darker than that in the lung because the lung still contains some small soft tissue structures, for example, vessels and bronchi. In this patient, the head looks quite white. It almost looks metallic, but that's just because of the exposure factors um, and the head is uh, quite dense bone and it's just underexposed relative to the rest of the radiograph. When we assess um, a structure or body cavity, it's important to do it systematically. And there's many ways of doing it. So the way um, I'm going through it here is just one way, but um, it's important to find a way that you don't miss any structures. So for the musculoskeletal system, I recommend starting out the outside, looking at the soft tissues, then moving on to the periosteum, which is an invisible layer that lines the outside of the cortex. So if it's not um, affected by pathology, it's not visualized as a separate structure. Then we can move on to the cortex. The endosteum, which is a layer on the inside of the cortex, again also not seen unless there is pathology there. The medulla, the joints, and then any obvious lesions. And one can compare the left and the right limb if there's any um, doubt about pathology. For the thorax, um, it's important also to start systematically, and I recommend starting on the outside, looking at the extrathoracic structures, for example, the cranial abdomen and the musculoskeletal system and soft tissues. Then it's um, nice to do it by, via an organ-based uh, approach, so we can look for the esophagus, which is usually not seen, but will run in this area. And he's usually only seen if it's gas filled or contains fluid or a foreign body or ingesta or a mass. Respiratory system, so the, the trachea and the lung parenchyma and bronchi, cardiovascular system, such as the heart, the aorta, and the caudal vena cava. Um, lymph nodes in the thorax are not normally seen, and when they are seen, it uh, means that they're enlarged. And the pleural and mediastinal cavities, which are potential spaces which are not visualized on a radiograph unless they contain gas um, or fluid. So for the abdomen, we can use a similar approach using an organ-based um, approach. So looking specifically for the spleen or the kidneys or the liver, etc., and making sure every organ is normal. It's also important to um, look at we call it edges and corners. For example, on the radiograph on the right, there is an obvious gas opacity within the thorax. So there's a pneumothorax, and all of the lungs show an increased opacity consistent with contusion. But if you miss evaluating the extrathoracic structures, this is just a close up of the caudal thorax, you'll miss the fracture of the vertebral body over here, which has a greater impact on patient prognosis than the pneumothorax or the lung contusion. Then finishing the evaluation, we decide if the pathology is significant or not. We make a diagnosis. We can make a list of differential diagnoses from the most to the least likely, and then suggest additional procedures that can be followed. If there's doubt, you can get a second opinion. Uh, there's a lot of teleradiology services available online that you can send radiographs to um, or ask a colleague. And so a completed radiological report will contain the history of the patient, the views, the radiological signalment, any technical problems, radiological findings and descriptions, the diagnoses or differential diagnoses, and additional tests and procedures. So here's just an example of what a report might look like. Um, and I've put up a few views here that you can um, scroll back and forth through at your own leisure. But um, so I'll give you some time on the next slide to go back to this. But essentially, this is what the report would consist of. We've got a history that this patient has a confirmed s lupi nodule with malignant transformation. All four distal limbs are severely swollen due to Mari's disease, and radiographs were taken to confirm these bone changes. So under the views, we just list um, what we found. So there's a dorsopalmal view of both distal thoracic limbs and a mediolateral of the left antibrachium and the distal left pelvic limb. 
This is a skeletally mature canine because there are no open physis. And the radiographic quality or artifacts, um, you can say that there's no artifacts or you can just say that the images are diagnostic. So the radiological findings is essentially a description of what is going on on the radiograph um, in a structured order manner. So um, I'm not going to go into detail over here. I'll let you hit pause just now and um, look at the radiographs again. But in conclusion, we can say it's severe, extensive polyostotic, which means multiple bones are affected, thick brush-like to lamellar periosteal reaction. We'll get to these later. We've made a diagnosis of hypertrophic osteopathy or Mari's disease secondary to an intrathoracic lesion. In this case, no further testing is needed because the diagnosis has already been made. So you can hit pause now, read through this, um, and go back to the previous image and just get an idea of how a report is written and how it flows. So the production of a radiological image depends on the physical thickness um, in centimeters and millimeters, the density, for example, air is less dense than fluid, which is less dense than solids. The atomic number, again, soft tissue has a lower atomic number than bone, and bone has a lower atomic number than metal. So please revise these again um, in the introductory section on physics. So I'm going to go through just a couple of examples, and we'll start with soft tissue. So we can get soft tissue um, swelling or an increased soft tissue mass, which may be diffuse or focal. Diffuse changes might be due to fluids, for example, um, if there's inflammatory fluid like cellulitis, an infiltrating neoplasia or muscle hypertrophy. Focal soft tissue swelling could be a neoplasm, it could be an abscess, a hematoma or a cyst, or it could be edema. So on the image on the top here, there's quite a large focal soft tissue swelling, which is located over the distomedial radius and over the carpal joint area. In the example of the pelvis, there's large soft tissue swelling, which is quite generalized over the right pelvic limb with some gas opacities in it. So this is probably a cellulitis with abscess patient. Soft tissue swelling may also be artifactual, so it's important to look out for this. So any skin nodules or folds superimposed over the area can look like a mass. For example, in this um, stifle image, there's a soft tissue swelling there and possibly another one over there. And these are just um, on the skin of the patient rather than masses. The prepuces or teats, uh, teats or nipples are also commonly seen. In this VD um, pelvis, there's this large round structure, that's the bladder, and superimposed over it is a more, um, almost more opaque soft tissue structure, and this is the prepuce. Wet hair and dirt can also show up as soft tissue opacities. Here's just another example. Um, on a lateral view over here, there's teats that are squashed. They're little round soft tissue nodules with air around them. And especially on the VD, they can appear to be nodules. In this case over here, um, there are multiple skin folds in a sharp pay. So there are these um, soft tissue lines with sort of interspersed more normal um, tissue opacity in between. So a decreased soft tissue mass um, can be due to muscle atrophy. And you'll see displacement and narrowing of the fascial planes. It could be due to skin defects. So if a chunk of um, skin or soft tissue is gone, then the structure becomes um, thinner. And any uh, anatomical variation. For example, um, the ligaments over the distal antibrachium in the dog often result in different uh, thickness of the structure, especially on a dorsal palm review, which makes some of the bone look more radiolucent. Here's an example of a normal pelvic limb. So normal, normal muscle versus a patient here with severe hip dysplasia, we can see how thin the soft tissue is. So there's severe disuse um, atrophy over here. Fascial planes, um, for example, over here, there's a bit of fat um, in between the muscle uh, bellies, in between the gastrocnemius and the um, superficial um, digital flexor. 
They can be obliterated if there's swelling that pushes it out, or they can displace also by masses or any soft tissue swelling and start bulging out. So we often use the soft, uh, the special planes between the soft tissue to see um, what the soft tissue itself is doing. Decreased soft tissue can also be due to fat. Fat is more radiolucent um, than soft tissue, if you remember back from the five opacities. So fat patients, any falciform of subcut fat is more radiolucent. So we go back to the fat cat. All of this is more radiolucent than the soft tissue structures such as the liver and the heart. And so we know that it's fat. Lipoma has the same effect. So this patient has a large, more radiolucent structure. You can cause it, call it a fat opacity within the abdomen. And you can see it's not the same opacity as the small intestines over here and the bladder over here as well as the pelvic um, and pelvic limb muscles. So this is consistent with fat and an intra-abdominal lipoma. Soft tissues uh, may also demonstrate mineralization. Rather use the word mineralization than calcification um, because not all of mineral is calcium. It can be generally split into two groups, dystrophic, where I remember D stands for damage. For example, in this case, the gastrocnemius tendon has got multiple little areas of dystrophic mineralization, likely secondary to trauma, or metastatic, M for metabolic. So hypervitaminosis D or chronic renal failure can cause mineralization in soft tissues. Calcinosis circumscripta is also a condition that occurs within soft tissues. It usually occurs in large breed dogs, less than two years of age, and also is seen in the equine patients. The cause is unknown, um, and usually it occurs around um, joints, for example, the stifle in this horse, the metacarpophalangeal um, joints in this canine, and um, again, the metacarpophalangeal joints in this canine in this dorsa palmar. It's usually incidental unless it starts putting pressure on the underlying structures, and it's usually got the stipple type of appearance, and it is separated from the underlying bone. Other types of mineralization includes myositis ossificans. That's when bone develops in the muscle, for example, in the triceps muscle over here. And fibrodysplasia ossificans is when bone forms within the fascial planes, but displaces the muscle. So in this cat, there's extensive mineralization or um, ossification within the muscles, uh, between the muscles, um, the semi ten and the semi mem in the fascial plans, as well as cranially over the stifle and the tibia on the CT image. Mineralization can also be due to newborn bone formation within soft tissue, so typically amorphous newborn. You can see all the speckled mineralized opacities here within the soft tissue, and this could be something like an extraskeletal osteosarcoma. Metal can also be present, um, for example, microchips, gunshots, or implants. And then um, there can be iatrogenic causes um, of, of structures or soft tissue changes. An example would be a sinogram or a fistulogram. That's where an iodinated contrast medium, for example here, is introduced into a wound, and we try to see where it goes and what structures it communicates with. Septopetal beads are um, antibiotic impregnated beam, uh, beads that have a, um, a radiopaque marker, and this was used in the olden days to treat osteomyelitis and implanted into the soft tissues. Gas can also be present within soft tissue, and this could be due to any puncture wounds um, or trauma possibly also bacteria that produce gas, so an infection, as well as um, if seen as a tubular structure, it can be due to a hernia. For example, on the left-hand image, there's a lot of tubular structures with gas opacity in the inguinal area, consistent with herniated soft intestine, uh, herniated small intestines. And on the right-hand side image, there's this round gas opacity over here, over the ischial table, and this is consistent with gas within the anal gland. So on the next few slides, we will look at what bone changes may occur radiologically. So 
for bone changes to be seen, 30 to 50 percent destruction is needed before the normal mineral opacity is lost. And this is at least a seven to 10 day process. So radiographs are not that sensitive to pick up early or subtle disease. And if you see nothing on a radiograph, you can always report, uh, repeat them 10 to 14 days later. Also looking at a few characteristics of what we are seeing in the bony changes helps determine how aggressive a lesion is. And that will help determine the differential diagnosis list. Here's some descriptors that also help um, lead to differential diagnosis for lesions. So monostotic lesion just means it's one bone. Polyostotic means multiple bones are affected. The lesion can be focal or generalized. It could be symmetrical or asymmetrical. And certain predilection sites, especially in neoplasia, may be affected. So an increased bone opacity may be artifactual, and this is sometimes due to overlapping of fracture fragments. For example, in this radiograph, there's these two rectangular areas that look quite white or more radiopaque than the rest of the bone. And this is because these fracture fragments are just superimposed over each other. Any soft tissue that superimposes or excessive soft tissue that superimposes over bone um, will lead that area to be thicker and therefore also appear more radiopaque. New bone formation can come from several areas. It can come from within the medulla of the bone. It can come from the trabecular bone, from the endosteum, or from the periosteum. And we'll discuss this a little bit more under musculoskeletal. But this is all periosteal new bone. Here's also some periosteal new bone with some bone in the soft tissue. Um, and this is callus new bone. So uh, there's different types of periosteal reactive bone that we can see, and it's usually secondary to injury. Periosteal reaction is just an addition of new bone to the underlying cortex, and there are five different types, from least to most aggressive. So we get solid, laminated, thick brush-like to thin brush-like, and the most aggressive is sunburst. So the solid periosteal reaction is the least aggressive, and it is usually quite smooth bone that's solid that is added onto the cortex as an example over here. It's usually slowly developing and the opacity is indicative of the duration. So the more opaque it is and the closer the opacity is to that of the cortex, the more mature it is. The surface might be slightly irregular and um, a Codman's triangle is a solid periosteal reaction that we see at the edge of a more aggressive lesion. And we'll discuss this a bit later and also under the musculoskeletal system. Laminated or onion skin periosteal reaction um, is a, of low aggressiveness, something like a, a chronic osteomyelitis. It's developed slowly and it's due to the periosteum being gradually lifted by permanent material or inflammatory debris, it lays a little bit of bone down and then it gets lifted again. And that's why it gets this onion skin type of appearance. So the lines are parallel to the cortex. And if there's only a single line versus multiple lines, it is known as a lamellar reaction. The thick brush-like periosteal reaction, also known as a um, palisading reaction, is moderately aggressive. And um, it forms perpendicular to the cortex. This is because the new bone gets deposited along Sharpie's fibers, and Sharpie's fibers anchor the periosteum to the cortex at 90 degrees um, to the cortex. And that is the reason why we get this 90 degree type of appearance. Thin brush-like is very much like thick brush-like. It's just um, the little brushes are thinner. And again, it's um, perpendicular to the cortex, it's more aggressive, and it's again because of the deposition of bone along the Sharpie's fibers, but it occurs much faster. Then for sunburst um, bone, this is the most aggressive type of periosteal reaction. It's radiating bone along the Sharpie's fibers, so it um, radiates outwards like this, almost in a, a sunrise or sunburst shape. So here's a lesion um, from the skull, and here is one from the radius, so a lot of new bone um, radiating outwards. 
And then um, amorphous or extracortical bone is the most um, aggressive type, but it's separate from the periosteum. So it occurs as fluffy new bone within the soft tissues, and it can occur with the other periosteal reactions, it, and it's very haphazard. So just getting back to the Codman's triangle, there is a solid periosteal reaction proximally with a more um, aggressive lesion distally and a bit of a thick brush-like reaction over here. So the Codman's triangle um, results because of the rapid lifting of the periosteum um, at the aggressive lesion, which also pulls towards um, the non-affected side um, of the lesion. Decreased bone opacity can also be seen. Um, this can be artifactual, for example, superimposing gas. Gas is more radiolucent than bone, and if the two are superimposed, um, the bone might look to have a decreased opacity. A superimposing skin defect or soft tissue defect, defect will make the area being um, radiographed thinner than the adjacent parts, again, resulting in radiolucency. And mach lines are optical illusions. They occur where two bones cross over each other or superimpose, for example, over here. And that results in a black line, which looks like a fracture, but it's just a, an optical illusion that's present. Nutrient foramina um, are diaphyseal arteries. For example, um, in the radius over here, that radiolucent structure over there penetrating the cortex is the um, nutrient foramina, and they occur at predictable location uh, in bones and are bilaterally symmetrical. Decreased bone opacity is due to increased osteoclastic activity, and I've mentioned already it takes seven to ten days to occur uh, or to be visible on a radiograph and only occurs after 30 to 50 percent of bone is lost. So we can have a generalized decreased bone opacity, for example, from hormonal, metabolic, or nutritional causes, um, or focal, which could be due to hyperemia, pressure, or disuse of a limb, and neoplastic destruction. A generalized bone loss is referred to as osteopenia, and this is the radiological term for reduced bone mass. It can be split into osteoporosis, which is a decreased quantity of bone, or osteomalacia, which is a failure to mineralize of the organic matrix. Now, we can't determine which one it is from radiographs, so the best word to use is just osteopenia. And if we look um, at these two images with a normal stifle on the left, the osteopenic stifle on the right is almost ghost-like. The, um, the bones are much more radiolucent and the cortices are very thin. And this is a lot of muscle atrophy over here. If you compare the muscles to the normal side, so this would be a case of disuse osteopenia. Focal bone loss um, can be seen as a single lesion, which can be quite, quite well defined. For example, this is a keratoma, which causes pressure lysis of P3 in the horse. And there's multiple little round um, lytic lesions in this dog's um, cervical spine, and this will be consistent with a multiple myeloma. So we also have specific terms that we use to describe lysis, and these are geographic, moth-eaten, and permeative lysis. So from least to most aggressive is geographic, um, moth-eaten, and permeative in that order. So geographic lysis um, usually occurs as one to three areas in the bone. They're quite large, usually more than 10 millimeters. It causes expansion of the cortex because um, there's usually a little bit of pressure on the cortex um, and can cause it to thin. And it might have a bit of a sclerotic border as the bone adjacent to it compresses. If it's absent, it might be slightly more aggressive. And it's got a narrow transition zone, which means it's easy to see the difference between normal and affected bone. So in my schematic image, um, a radiolucent lesion would just be a large um, lytic lesion. There's just an example here of a radius and ulna. These um, geographic lysis areas are quite well defined, um, and there's a bit of a sclerotic border over there. Moth-eaten lysis is um, 
more, a more aggressive process. It's faster growing. It's usually several lytic areas of three to five millimeters that may coalesce together. So all these little structures, these little punctate lucencies, the cortex may get destroyed and it'll start eroding it or causing lysis from the inside. This often has an indistinct margin, so we don't know or it's not easy to tell what's normal and what's um, affected bone. And um, it's got a wide transition zone, which means that the transition from abnormal to normal bone is over a long or a, a wide distance. So in my schematic image, it's smaller little radiolucent lytic lesions that can conglomerate or coalesce. Permeative lysis is the most aggressive. It's very um, rapidly growing. There's definitely indistinct margins. We can't really define each one separately. These ones have coalesced, so it's got a fluffy lytic appearance. It's got a wide transitional zone, so it's very difficult to say what here is normal and what's abnormal bone. And then cortical changes are definitely present. So here, the cortices are completely destroyed. There's no cortex over here. Um, this whole bone is lytic. If you compare it to the ulna, which is quite normal over here, this cortex um, or the, the bone is completely destroyed and lytic. And my schematic also just shows that these are um, multiple small areas that are indistinct and um, conglomerating. Then we can look at the cortex as well. Um, if we look at a transverse section through the bone as well as sort of a more longitudinal section, it, it just shows where the margins of the bone are. So the endosteal surface is on the inside of um, the cortex and the subperiosteal surface is on the outside. And these are areas um, that get affected by lysis and that give that moth eaten or permeative appearance. So from least to most aggressive, any cortical expansion or thinning is usually due to a more benign or low aggressive process, for example, pressure lysis. Scalloping refers to endosteal or subperiosteal lysis. So endosteal, it starts making little lucent areas or takes bites out of the endosteum, where subperiosteal, it does it from the outside of the cortex. And then if the cortex is completely destroyed, it may form a spike um, or a rounded defect. And these are the most aggressive lesions. So this would be more consistent with a neoplasm, for example. So the type of lesion um, can be classified according to how aggressive it is. And for this, we look at the location. Um, some neoplasms have got very specific sites. We look at uh, the types of bone destruction, so geographic moth eaten or permeative lysis. We look at the different types of periosteal reactions from the smooth uh, solid periosteal all the way up to sunburst. We look at the edge character. Um, are the lesions smooth or are they very irregular? Can you see them clearly or are they hazy? We look at the transitional zone. Is there a clear distinction between normal and abnormal bone? Um, and is that zone a uh, very rapid transition or does it occur over a long extent of the bone? Cortical destruction, we see is the cortex intact or destroyed? Um, and then the rate of change. A benign uh, condition will have a very slow rate of change with follow-up radiographs, whereas something highly aggressive like an osteosarcoma can change rapidly over days um, or sometimes weeks. So this is how we grade them. I've just discussed everything. So from non-aggressive to aggressive, um, bone destruction goes from geographic all the way to permeative. Periosteal reaction goes in steps all the way up to amorphous bone. Uh, the edge of the lytic focus can be well demarcated or poorly defined. The transition between normal and um, affected bone can be narrow or wide. Cortical destruction could be none or could be thinned or expanded, or to spike formation and scalloping. And the rate of change after 10 to 14 days, if it's non-aggressive, there's none to minimal, um, with marked change in the more aggressive lesion. So we grade the lesion, or the we grade the um, degree of aggressiveness of a lesion by the most aggressive change. So if you have a lesion that has permeative lysis, but only a thick brush-like reaction, which falls in the middle, I will grade it according to the permeates of lysis and say that it's highly aggressive. And then, of course, follow-up radiographs are needed to determine the progression of a lesion. 
So here's just um, towards the end now some good references. We've got um, websites that can uh, that show some good anatomy. Uh, weekly cases you can subscribe as well, and uh, once a week they'll send out a nice practice case to look at. And then there are some good books um, that are also available um, for you to have a look at. And then here's just a, a last slide on how a radiological description works. So we've got an example of a large breed dog that presents for pelvic limb lameness, and we've got um, two views presented. So I think spend some time looking um, at these, at these uh, images. We haven't discussed anything really in musculoskeletal, but see if you can see what the changes are, and then I will have the answers on the next slides. All right, so we start with the signalments, um, say which views they are, and then looking at the quality, the dorsa palmar or the dorsa plantar view is underexposed. You can see that the peripheral blackening is not adequate versus the uh, mediolateral view. And then this is the description of the lesions, and I've just put the two images for you to have a look at. Um, just running through it briefly, there is soft tissue swelling. You can see that there's lobulated soft tissue swelling here. Um, there is lysis of the distal tibia over here, moth eaten to permeative. There is scalloping or erosion from within, so the endosteum is affected. Uh, the cortices are slightly thinned. Um, there is some periosteal reaction present, um, which is a thick brush like periosteal reaction that is quite intermittent. Um, it's difficult to say because of the underexposure, but the fibula doesn't seem to be involved. And um, the rest, you can just take some time and read through it just to get an idea of how a description flows. And it can be quite um, creative. So feel free to describe as if you're doing creative writing. So then we get to the conclusion. We'll say it's a, a monostotic osteoblastic and osteolytic lesions because there's um, both bone formation and lysis and we can call it an aggressive tibial lesion. So because of the type of lysis present, which is permeative, I will grade it to be aggressive. Diagnosis is most likely an osteosarcoma. Um, it's a bit of an unusual location, which we'll get to in the musculoskeletal system, um, much less likely to be a tumor like a fibrosarcoma. So under comments or additional tests, we can say that FNAs or biopsies can be performed, and then thoracic radiographs or CT, which is better, um, can be done to look for lung metastasis. And that is the end of the section.